Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 138 of the show. I am Ramon Mejia, I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. And this week I have eight new Lit RPG reviews for you, just for you folks at home. Uh, and that includes the title Siphon, a book, uh, sorry, a touch of power, book number one. After that it'll be the review for the Idol System, the new journey. And then it'll be Changing World. The Beginning, which is a, a Russian translation, and then it'll be Rift World Online, book number one. Then it's going to be High School Dungeon Crawl, level one. After that, it'll be Rank Zero, a sci-fi little RPG, Cyberlinks, book one, Cyberlinks trilogy. <laughs> Long title. Uh, then it'll be The Realm Between the Curse. Sorry, The Realm Between the Curse, a little RPG saga, book number one. And last but not least, it'll be Viridian Gate Online, side quests. So, excellent stuff there. Uh, before big do that, though, we're going to go into Lit RPG News. And in Lit RPG News, we have just a couple titles, a couple articles, I should say. Uh, one is that Life Reset has been listed by Audible as their one of their five-star faves in fantasy and science fiction this month. Uh, so congrats to uh, Shemer, Shemer um, the, author who, the author of this particular article. So good job, man. Uh, also in Little Bridge News, we have Alaron Kong, author of the Chaos Heat series, is giving away 10 signed copies of his books. Yay! Um, this is unfortunately only available to folks in the continuous United States. Shipping costs internationally are <laughs> super expensive. Um, but you can enter, I have a link in the show notes where you can click on, you can enter from there. But it's actually being um, run through the uh, Goodreads page for the first book in that series. So you can also just go there and you click on the enter the contest button. So that'll also get you into that contest. Yeah, it looks like the contest will also be running up until... August the 31st of this year. So, okay. On to some other titles that are out now. I haven't had a chance to read them, but they're out now. Ready for you to read, folks. Uh, this includes Mechs and Violence, Infinite Lives Online, book number two. We review book number one in the last podcast. Pillow book number two is out now. Uh, also, what now is Random, The Chaos of Lincoln Hearts, Bracador, book number six. The 11th book in the Feral series is also out currently, uh, as is the latest short story from Robert Bevan in the Cavern of the Creature series called Cross My Fart, Hope to Die. Uh, and uh, the Arcane Kingdom Online, the Chosen, the Liberty Adventure book number one, uh, that is out now as well. So all these great stuff. Uh, in audiobooks, we have a couple of new releases in the audiobooks for Liberty as well, uh, including External Threats, Reality Bender series book number two. That one is currently out. I believe book number three just came out very fairly recently. Uh, in the ebook version, uh, this is the audiobook version, and this is only book two. Uh, also, not as an audiobook, is the second book in the Accidental Champion trilogy called Accidental Raiders. So, all kinds of new Lit RPG audiobooks for you folks to enjoy as well. Um, we have a few new titles in the upcoming Lit RPG series, but this is just where I read off a bunch of stuff that's coming out in the near future uh, for free to skip ahead. But we do have new entries in this list as well. Uh, on October 19th, it'll be Respawn Lost Lovers. And that's the second book in that particular series. On October the 25th, it'll be Air Today, Pond Tomorrow, which is the second book in the Good Guy series. On October the 26th, it'll be Beginnings. Uh, that's the first book in the Peaks of Power uh, series. And then on October 31st, Base Status Online, an unlikely little RPG journey. On November 1st, it'll be Never Fall, Mark of the Hero. On November the 2nd, this one's definitely exciting for a lot of people. Um, and this continues to have better sales as a pre-order uh, than many books do in their entire career. Uh, and, and Desolation, The Divine Dungeon, book number four. So Dakota has a card as a good series. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, on November the 8th, it's going to be The Parallel, a sci-fi liturgy series. It's the second book in the Infinite Exodus series. November the 18th, it's the third book in the series of The Guardians of the Roundtable. Uh, on November the 19th, The Song of Shadow, the second book in the Bardo Barleona series. Um, and November the 20th, it'll be Island Kingdom's War, which is Evolution's online's third book in that series. And again, this is one of the new ones in the in the listings here. November the 30th, it'll be the next book in the Eden's Gate series called The Omen. I'm not sure if this is book, I think this is book five. Yeah, it says in the cover. Book five, The Omen. Sounds supernatural or something. Um, and December the 10th, it'll be Hero, uh, which is the second book in the Level Up series. December the 16th, Free Heaven Online, book number three, Winter Dungeon Line, and another new one in the list. 
This is going to come out on January the 9th, 2019. It is up for pre-order now. Um, it's called Level Up, The Knockout, book number one. And though it has the same um, series title, the Level Up Universe, it's actually a side story with a different main character. I, I, I'm guessing that's actually related to the short story uh, that Magic Dome put together a, a few months ago in their short story collection series. might be related to that one. Um, but it's the same universe, um, same author. It is just a different main character, so it's more of a side story. So there you go, just so you can manage your expectations. But again, um, I enjoy that particular universe, so hopefully it'll be fun. Okay, on to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we're going to begin with Siphon, A Touch of Power, book number one, written by Jay Boyce. It is 272 pages. It is $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Jade has spent her life fighting boredom in the Terminate Ill Ward. Surfing the net or reading, she always envied the ability of others to go out and experience the world. She knew her wish to live a normal life was beyond her reach. But after waking up to one morning, after waking up one morning without the sounds of her life support, she opens her eyes and finds herself with a weak but healthy body in a magical world. As blue game-like system notifications fill up her vision. She knows that she'll have to adapt quickly in order to survive. But this is all she's ever dreamed of, so Jade is up to the challenge. She will soon realize that you need to be careful what you wish for. Um, this is this is Andrea and our where her true adventure finally begins. So there, that's the last note on <laughs> that particular novel description from the author. Okay, uh, full disclosure, I received an advanced copy for review, but purchased a copy of the novel when it came out. Uh, this is basically transported to an RPG fantasy world. It turns into something like a crossover between um, the Princess Diaries and a magical academy story. Um, and, and although it doesn't have the same like tropes exactly as either one of those tales, it's kind of the closest um, description I could give in like, one sentence. Um, Jay, the main character, wakes up to find herself not bedridden and dying, but in a fantasy RPG world where she has an RPG profile page listing her stats, her name, her age, and her one special ability, Siphon. Um, Siphon will let her grow both physically and magically, but at the cost of ma a major appetite and, if overused, great physical pain. Um, the MC explores the main character. Uh, sorry, main character in this uh, explores the new fantasy city she's in, meeting new friends, learning about magic, applying for school, and doing all the things she couldn't when she was on Earth. Uh, mixed in this is a comedic element where she goes around pushing boundaries, yelling and intimidating the nobility, and charming the royal family. And that's kind of where the um, Princess Diary aspect uh, comes in. Uh, the main character insists that she doesn't want to fight. I'm sorry. Um, there are some, a is some action, but only a couple scenes. The main character insists she doesn't want to fight and instead wants to reinvent things from our world to make life better for people there in that fantasy RPG world. Um, most of the story just follows her as she rambunctiously adventures, surprising everyone with her spunky attitude, her huge appetite, and her tendency to find trouble in the most unlikely of places. This is a cute not really action focused story. Um, and it's just, most of it's very slice of life. Um, game mechanic wise, very light. Uh, you mostly see most of the mechanics when the main character uses her siphon ability, um, which gives her kind of the snapshot of someone else's profile to see what skills and stats they have that she can take. Um, you can also see the mechanics whenever she looks at her own profile, which is another way of saying character sheet. Um, the, Profiles already dealt. There's lots of numbers, including some decimals. So like, oh, that's that would actually be have to have decimal system in this story if you're gonna in that just in the terms of what that siphon ability does. Um, I don't want to spoil. It's kind of a nice, nice little mechanic. Um, and as her stats increase, her physical stats or her intellectual stats, whatever it is, um, there actually are physical changes described for the main character. So the the stats in the story do actually matter. Like there's an actual physical relationship between those numbers and how she's described and how she fills out as those stats increase in the story. So I actually like that. Um, unfortunately, the same can't be said for the other numbers in the, in, in the, in the story, whether they're going to be related to the magic system or to the, like the skill system, those things don't really have a presence in the rest of the story to a degree. Um, then that, this is mostly just because the magic and two systems they don't seem to have any rules. And this was a little more disappointing. This was one of the things that really bothered me most about the story. Um, it doesn't ruin or anything. Um, it's just not the thing that I really like the most about the story. And that's just because, again, um, magic doesn't seem to have a cost beyond making the main character tired in kind of these vague terms. 
Um, magic is more described as the main character imagining something happening, willing it to happen, and then it's just sort of happening, and that's it. There's no incantations, there's no special gestures, no weaving together elemental streams or anything like that. Um, it's very like she might as well just like twitching her nose and going, you know, and making a wish or something. And that's that is about as as, as complicated as the magic system seems to be as ruled out. Um, and these for the skills, it's even less defined. Like you, you'll see her increase the number of skills. Um, in the story and she's like as they increase there really is no change in what she can necessarily do um, relating to those skills um, and so they don't really feel like they have an impact um, so that that's again one of the probably the biggest straws so it's, it's, it's just that in a little PD story where you're defining your stats and your and your skills and and all these bunch of numbers you see in character sheets um, for that same amount of detail not to be applied to a, a magic system which is honestly really can potentially be really cool um, it was just a little disappointing to see that lack of kind of boundaries are building. Maybe something that all three plans to change in the rest of the book when she goes, when the main character goes to that magical academy finally. Um, but in this one, it felt very um, ruleless and um, kind of, yeah, so it was like a slight disappointment. Um, there are a couple of other things in the story that bothered me. Um, when people who were born in this other world who have no connection to our modern world use modern slang, that always trips up my brain. It's like, that doesn't sound right. Um, also th though the main character is supposed to be 18 in the story, the way she talks, especially in the early part of the story, her speech patterns and her, her sense on using incomplete sentences makes her sound like she's 10. So it's a little confusing. Um, also, um, again, that magic and skill system thing without rules, just, it bothered me, but I already mentioned that, um, in the early part of the story, the main character comes off as entitled and demanding. And this is probably one of the things that might bug people the most, but I'm just letting you know, it doesn't continue throughout the entire story. It's just that in the beginning of the story, she just shows up in this new world. Uh, she has no money, no knowledge. And then she declares the room she finds herself has hers. She eats a massive amount of food for the place that she's staying in. Um, she demands that they give her special objects and do favors for her. Uh, and all without ever offering compensation and really even saying a thank you. And that for some reason, that particular attitude bothered me because they're basically just people doing their jobs. And, and, and that attitude just, I said, it, it, it bugged me for some reason. It felt, came off again as kind of entitled and demanding. And it doesn't really make sense for the character either because up to that point in her life, she'd just been kind of bedridden. Um, and so you think she'd have more empathy for people who are just trying to get through life. But again, like I said, it's a thing. And again, after about the 30% mark of the story, that attitude totally mellows. It doesn't continue through the story. I mean, her, 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 um, briskness and her kind of being pushy, that definitely continues, but those become endearing traits. Um, she starts to say thank you. And when she starts making her money, she starts to appreciate things and she starts to, um, thank and help people who, support, who have been supporting her goals. Um, and the pushy, overly confident, sharp tongue attitude, again, kind of becomes charming. Um, when she wields it against like social bullies um, or people who are trying to take a manager who are looking down on her, looking down upon her um, instead of just normal people who are trying to do their jobs. Uh, so again, those are some things that have bothered me and I've talked to some of the people and they kind of agree that, Oh, those things stuck out to them as well. But again, overall the character does develop into something that, that is a very charming, very interesting um, overall. Again, despite the few things that bothered me here, I like the story. I don't want you to think that I didn't. I actually did. Um, but it wasn't necessarily becomes of like the deep RPG mechanics. The siphon ability, super cool. I think it's it's really, really used. I, again, like the decimal system. I'm like, oh, that that makes sense. And the description of the particular um, skill and ability. Um, I, I expected it to be used in a different way, but the way it's used here is perfectly fine. And the main character, again, becomes charming um eventually throughout the story um she becomes you see her as a go-getter who doesn't want to let anybody stand in way of her goals she's determined to live the life to the fullest because she was you know she wasn't expected to live in that other world in our world um and that dichotomy kind of creates a character you can't help but root for and i think that's kind of the thing that's the most um outstanding of the story is that it's the main character that's the person you're rooting for that's the person you come you, you come to be invested in and again um the action when it does appear is good it's just that there's not a lot of it they're essentially just like a couple of fight scenes um towards the end of the story and hopefully that will change in book two um but for now this story is entertaining but it's not like the most entertaining thing in the world um it gets a score of 7.2 out of 10 i found it entertaining i did i liked it that it was good um and that's uh, siphon a touch of power book number one with a score of 7.2 Two out of ten. So there you go. Okay. Next is the idol system by Pigaz. That's what it says in the cover. Um, it is the first book in the series called The New Journey. 
It is 290 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. After an unexpected death, John, wake up, John wakes up in another world where a system guides him along. In this world, he is known as a cider, someone who has, re- who has reincarnated from Earth. In the beginning, John only aims to survive, but as his journey unfolds, he discovers something else to fight for. His new goal has a time limit, but the stakes are high. If John fails to make it in time, his one and only chance at a new life will be over. A bit in story here, there are even larger forces at play. A seemingly harmless individual turns out to be a member of the royalty, and their family has use has use for a cider like John. If the Swara family plays their cards where the kingdom will fall victim to the reign of a new king with an iron grip, will the royal family succeed in using John for their own power-hungry purposes, or will he discover their scheme and put an end to their tyranny? There we go. Uh, and that actually honestly just kind of describes um, the series as a whole. This is a, an online series uh, that has been chopped up a little bit, and this is the first portion of it. So there you go. Um, I think that more describes like the larger serial series as a whole um i should mention that um okay so this is a slice of life transported to game world story um but by the halfway marks turns into an overpowered main character story so there's a lot of things there um you follow the main character as he arrives at this new world and he has to figure out the game system that will define his life he fights loads of monsters fighting is probably the biggest thing here um, and has some cool adventures. The most interesting part of the story, at least to me, and the thing that kind of separates this from other slice of life stories is definitely the game mechanic of the system, the idol system, which is again, the title of the novel. Um, so here we go. So in addition to like the normal HP counters and stamina counters, the main character has a finite number of idol counters that he can assign to skills and abilities and attacks. And the more idol counter he assigns there, the faster his skill will auto level. Um, so the main character is presented with a like a huge group of uh, a list of skill groups, um, in, including making more idle counters or uh, shortening the amount of or actually increasing the amount of time that the idle counters will take off into uh, getting that skill to auto level, um, and a bunch of other things like that. And so actually a lot like a good chunk of the story is is the main character kind of discovering new skills and kind of seeing how to maximize this system to to make him grow as fast as possible um there's also this like cultivation aspect that's incorporated into the story as he improves specific body parts at a time so you'll, you'll, you'll if you've ever like read cultivation self you'll feel like a familiar thread there where you're like increasing his bone density or his uh the amount of his blood supply and they have like definite finite benefits as he like chooses to increase them and add idle counters. Um, but again, a lot of this story is basically about uh, time and resource management, which seems kind of boring, but if you're into like numbers and like maximizing skill sets and things like that, this is going to be super fascinating to you. Like it really is like, that's probably the biggest draw of the story. Um, when I was reading it, I'm, I'm totally into numbers. I'm a numbers dude. Um, when I was reading this, I would look at the description and I'd be thinking, okay, how would I maximize my my personal growth if I had a system? And even though the main character chose some other things to do, um, it was sort of really fun to kind of hypothesize and like, you know, crunch some numbers and think, okay, and experiment. Cause that's what the main character does in the story. He basically looks at the system and he figures out, okay, how do I, how do I, how do I use this? How do I, how do I maximize this? How do I like exploit this to my greatest benefit? So he does a bunch of experiments and he, you know, he adds auto counters here and there and sees which skills take the longest and which one benefit the most from like these particular like system uses. And it's a bunch of fun stuff like that. Um, and so again, if you're into numbers and figuring out how to maximize your opportunity characters, you're probably going to enjoy this because that's probably the biggest differentiating factor between this and any other like um, wushu or, or cultivation kind of story. Um, there are a few flaws in the novel. It's not perfect. Um, there are some big plot holes. Um, there are some kind of annoying to me, at least some time jumps, sometimes of like years or like months or years. Um, there are a few too many info dumps that I feel like could have been stretched out or like shown instead of told. And there's some semi-regular technical writing issues. Um, nothing major, just like things like missing words and extenses, other grammar mistakes. Um, they come about every couple pages. So it's not like super every pay- paragraph or any, every sentence, but it's like, oh, on a semi-ish regular basis. Um, and I know that doesn't bother me, but like, I know some people it is going to bug. Again, this is one of those things that it's it's written online as a serial story and then put here um, on you know, Amazon as a sectional. Um, overall though, it's fun, it's action oriented and it has a unique game system, which I appreciate it. So for me, it gets a score 7.4 out of 10. That's the idle system, the new journey with the score 7.4 out of 10. So thanks. Okay. Next, it's going to be changing world. The beginning written by Sergey Katz. 
It is 362 pages. It is $2.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. And it has one of the shortest uh, novel descriptions of anything on the show today. Uh, it's this. The game world was beautiful and realistic, but something went wrong from the very start. How was a new character supposed to choose a class? How was he supposed to survive? Just one wrong step could mean imminent death. That's it. That, that's all you get from the novel description. And it does not um, do a wonderful job of even describing this as like lit RPG. Um, but it is. Um, I, I should note that this is a translation work. It's translated really from Russian. And there are some translation issues with the story. Some phrases don't translate well. Um, for example, like the word ability, for some reason, is replaced with the word agility. So you'll see things like, oh, uh, this guy has a great agility skill uh, in, in fighting. And uh, you'll see that in Maryland. Um, also, um, dialogue quotation marks are missing from the entire thing. For some reason, there's some translation issue um, where instead of like um, quotation marks on the end of dialogue, it's, it's dashes. So it'll be like, dash. Oh, look, an apple. Dash, he said. And it's, it, it's a little weird at first. Uh, for me, I eventually just got used to it. It's just one of the things like, oh, there's there's not a ton of dialogue here in the first place. So a lot of the story is him like just thinking to himself or describing things. And so um, that didn't bother me. But I know some people are really like my I asked my wife. She's like, oh, no, that's that. I can't read this. Never mind. Put it away because I wanted to see if it will bug her. And it did. OK, um, so while the story puts the main character in a VR MMORPG, um, th- for a lot of ways, this actually feels like a transported to a game world since the main character never leaves the game and the non-player characters act like normal people with personalities, deep histories, unique cultures. Um, on the game mechanic side, this is a skill based system. So there are no levels with automatic increases in attributes or stat points or anything like that. Um, instead, everything is earned through practice, experimentation or being taught. Skills are discovered and increased through use. Stats increased through training or through use in combat. Um, so there are loads of notifications and they're for these kinds of increases and their associated bonuses. Um, story-wise, there, there were a couple of major story quest arcs. Um, this is another slice of life story. Like there's no major, like, let's go save the world or stop the evil AI from destroying everybody. Nothing like that. This is just the main character goes into adventures. Um, you follow him as he fumbles his way through the world and figures out how everything works. And then again, goes on some neat adventures and some that are really good. Uh, personally, the beginning was the most fascinating part for me. The main character makes a mistake um, and he misses out on the tutorial section of, of, of the experience. And he has to figure out how everything works the hard way through like trial and error and surviving and exploring the forest. And then it leads him to some very um, unique situations that he wouldn't have normally come across if he had actually done the tutorial. Um, so it's one of those situations where, oh, he gets makes an early mistake, but it then turns into a, a benefit for him. So good stuff there. But I really did like the combination of like the, some early survivalish stuff with exploration and discovery elements. It was, it was nice and fun. Um, I will note that the last 5% of the story was annoying to me. Um, and it, it it's really more than like, oh, well, the story is going along fine. And then it just takes this weird turn that I wasn't expecting. It isn't really set. It feels like it comes out of nowhere and it forces the story into this cliffhanger instead of wrapping it up nicely, which it was on its way to do. So um, it's going to bother some readers. I know it bothered me. It didn't, bother, it didn't ruin the story, but I was like, oh, that's annoying. Um, overall, though, I enjoyed reading it. It was fun. Um, it was neat to discover how the game world worked as the main character did and how his initial detriment again became an asset to him. It was, he worked hard throughout the entire story. And I think that, that, pro, that made the progress feel very, um, real and finite and enjoyable, at least for me. So uh, for me, it gets a score of 7.6 out of 10. That's changing world, the beginning with a score of 7.6 out of 10. Okay. Next. It's going to be Rift World Online, book number one, Space Opera Insertion, written by Brian Howard. It is 215 pages, $2.99. It is available on Canon Limited. And here is the author's description. Rift World Online is an action-packed literary ride that combines Escape from New York and Tron in an epic adventuring, adventure-spanning world of space opera, fantasy, the Old West, and more. By the way, that's not quite true um, in this particular novel, I should say. Um, in 2028, Rift World Online is the most popular virtual reality MMORPG ever. A week after its release, millions are playing in a game that spans seven unique universes. But now, people can't log out. And when they die in the game, they die in real life. In prison for manipulating real-world currency through VR MMORPGs, gamer Rick Danberg just wants to serve out his sentence in peace. But the president's daughter is trapped in the game. Secret Service agents drag Rick before the president who offers him a deal. A full pardon 
for finding her and keeping her alive until people on the outside get referral back on, under control. So there you go. Um, this is a decent enough adventure story. It is. Um, the game mechanics are shown throughout the story constantly. It is a RPG. Um, it's a very sci-fi RPG. There's cyborgs, laser guns, spaceships, and space pirates and more. So it's very sci-fi. If that's what you're looking for, um, this has it. Um, though the setup for the game universe pushes... Uh, a multiverse with game worlds for Western, post-apocalypse, fantasy, space opera, superhero, cyberpunk, and steampunk. Um, those things are supposed to be existing in this world. So even though this one is very sci-fi, don't expect the sci-fi to continue in books two, three, or four, whatever, how many are in the series, because it seems like the author plans to go um, universe hopping and kind of explore these different genres at the same time and, and still kind of incorporate um, different elements from each world as he crosses over. Um, the action of the story is good, and that's probably the highlight of the story. Um, but because of that premise in the novel, it, it kind of gives some stuff away. I remember the premise is essentially that the main character is in prison. He's, uh, he, he goes on this mission to, to save the president's daughter, um, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a VR MMORPG where everyone is stuck in the game. And if they die in the game, they die in real life. That's never explained, but that's the premise. And he has, so he's, he's agreed to go in there exchange for a pardon. Right. Um, and, and that premise kind of sets up, sets, sets up things that the, uh, audience is going to know, for example, like because it's going to be dying in the game, dying in real life, you know, the main character is never, ever going to die. And that is the case absolutely in the story. And that with that informs readers that the main character is always going to survive. And he does. He saved miraculously time and again from death many times. And it's just one of those disappointments. Um, the trapped in the game, dying in the game, dying in real life story. It's, it's, it's again, something that the main character actually voluntarily goes into. And I kind of had the problem with that premise because, um, the setup just doesn't make sense. Like any gamer who's with assault would never do this like ever, 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 because you would never expect to ever die, not die in a game that you've never played or never even heard of. Um, and so the main character essentially is signing up. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go in the game. Um, I, I know I'm going to die probably, but I'm just going to do anyways. And you know, that it just doesn't make sense. Even though he, like, he thinks he's assuming that he's such an amazing gamer that he's never going to die. Like, to me, that just that that mindset bothered me because again, that premise, the fundamental premise story is like, oh, that's doesn't doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the die in the game, die in real life aspect is a premise that's really kind of semi popular in liturgy since people have watched like Sword Art Online, and that story really did it well. And I think that's probably one of the best examples of it being done well. Um, in that, uh, but unfortunately. <laughs> Not everybody has has used it as as as, as well, unfortunately. Uh, in the anime, that pl players are trapped in a situation against their will. They're given a chance of freeing everyone if they risk their lives to meet a particular goal. So there's like a reason for them to like risk their lives. Um, most people, however, in that anime react the way you think they would. They no longer adventure. And instead, they stick to safe zones. They craft they do other things to support like, the people who are actually adventuring. But they stay in places that they're not going to be harmed and there's no risk for them to die, as most people naturally would only relatively few people continue in any uh, attempt to to free everyone to risk their lives fighting monsters and bosses um in this story that doesn't exist i mean said player versus player content goes on without players blinking um every player continues to adventure for no reason even though they know dying means permadeath um additionally the premise informs the reader again that no matter what happens the main character is just not going to die and again every time the main character nears death he miraculously avoids it uh, or the story is crafted just so that the bad guy kind of stands there and he takes uh all the, all the all the main characters like blows without defending himself because otherwise the main character would die uh and so it's just one of those annoying things that you <laughs> that just pops up again and again right because again it's informed by that premise like oh you die in the game you die in real life which isn't necessary for this in any way, shape, or form, like that particular, I mean, it's supposed to add like uh, an issue of tension, like, oh, it's tense. Like if he dies, if he fails, he dies in real life. And that's not necessary for video game story for a little RPG necessarily. Like there's really nothing that that adds um, to the story. Like it's, it really isn't needed, uh, but it's again, something you see time and again. Okay, now beyond that, um, the part of the premise where the main character is supposed to track down this girl to protect her also has some huge plot holes uh, in the MMO. In this MMO, there are literally tens of thousands of planets spread out over seven full universes. Yet, the main character, for some reason, able to, to pick up on this girl's trail at the very start of the game on the on the starter planet he starts at. Even though that it's really clear to find this right, that she starts out in a different world entirely. So, it doesn't make sense that happens. But again, it's something that I guess is needed to move the plot forward. Um, instead. 
Additionally, again, the main character actually doesn't advance the plot very much. Instead, he lands on a planet, he picks a faction, he does some quest, and that and that and that faction kind of does all the work in finding leads on that girl. Um, then he moves on the planet, and it just kind of repeats. Out of the first thirty percent of the story, um, it makes things a little predictable. Um, overall, though. Uh, the story isn't boring. I don't really think that it's horrible. It's not. Like I said, the action is good. Um, the storyline, again, gets a little predictable, but like the background of the of the story is really well developed. The sci-fi elements of it are well done. It's just that because of the premise and because of the predictability pre- of the story, um, my enjoyment it was reduced uh, severely enough, at least for me at least. You, but however, if you've never read or watched the anime stored online, um, or you just have a, like a, a jonesing for a sci-fi a little bit, you might enjoy this better than me. But for me, I, I just, it didn't work for me. Gives a score of six out of 10. That's Rift World Online, book number one, Space Opera Insertion with a score of six out of 10. So there you go. Okay, on to our next review. It's going to be High School Dungeon Crawl Level 1. And you know what? The author's name isn't actually on the cover. So, sorry. It is 71 pages. It is $1.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. And you know, let me look up the author's name. You, you write things, you want credit for it. It's written by Scott Mikoski. So there you go, Scott. Um, here's the author's description. The first day of high school was never fun. There's the new campus, classmates, and teachers. It's an entirely new world. Literally. Everything has changed. People are turning into heroes and monsters. Classrooms have become entire levels that might explore danger. All Mason has to do is level up enough to survive the sprawling dungeon and get home, as long as there's a home still there. Actually, not a bad novel description. It does a fairly good job describing what this is supposed to be. Um, this is an RPG apocalypse story sent to high school. The main character is a new kid. And when the RPG apocalypse happens, he becomes a level zero ordinary. Uh, he doesn't have a class. Um, he finds some allies. He finds some monsters. He levels. And that's kind of it. This is a short story that I think is meant to be like a serialized short story series. Um, there are additional attempts at humor. Uh, sorry, not humor, but horror. There, are, there is humor. It doesn't work for me either. Uh, but both of those aspects just don't kind of do well. Um, there are a lot of small technical writing errors, and the writing is a little awkwardly phrased sometimes. Combat isn't well described, nor does it make RPG sense sometimes. Um, the main character, for example, is almost killed by a monster who's worth 10 XP points, but he easily one-shots uh, a monster worth 300 XP points, and he breezes through a fight later on with the monster who's worth 3,000 XP points without ever being hurt. Um, so you can see like the combat doesn't actually match like the logic of either RPG mechanics or what's actually described in the story. Um, the rest of the game mechanics can involve appearing throughout the story, things like item descriptions, um, like monster uh, descriptions and things like that. They they do appear, but they don't always make sense either. Um, overall, the novel wasn't particularly entertaining for me on the whole. Again, um, not particularly horrible. I don't hate it by any means. It just wasn't, it's was just kind of boring. Uh, so if it gets a score of 5 out of 10, simple review. That's 5 out of 10 for High School Dungeon Crawl, level 1. Okay, next one, it's uh, Rank Zero, a sci-fi lit RPG, Cyberlinks book, Cyberlinks trilogy, written by Rory, uh, Rory Stathos. It is 200 pages, $3.99, it is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. It's only a game until your life depends on it. Beaten into debt by failure, Alex takes up an offer to reset his VR game character in hopes of restoring his bank account. When these past failures catch up with him, he has to choose between protecting his new friends or becoming trapped in a poverty-stricken world. If you're looking for one, oh, that's just, that's a, it's a, okay. Um, the long and the short of the view is basically that while this isn't a bad cyberpunk novel, it's not good loot RPG. Uh, while there are regular skill increases and the XP given in the story um, as the main character plays the VR game, fundamentally, the game mechanics in the story don't matter. And they don't even follow their own rules sometimes. Um, additionally, the very premise of the story has a hole big enough to, ru- uh, to ruin the entire story, at least for me. Um, and that's mostly because of math. Um, after the main character restarts his character in the story, uh, it shows that skills must be purchased with cert points that are bought through XP. He purchases some of these skills and then only a few paragraphs later starts using weapons that he doesn't have the skills for. And, and not only uses them, but seems to be an expert, almost one-shotting a very powerful enemy later on. Um, additionally, he insta-levels up these skills and others that he doesn't actually have. Uh, so he'll like start getting skills that like, oh, that wasn't in that earlier character sheet section. 
Um, further on in the story, the main character again constantly does things that he shouldn't according to the game skill sets he has, which tells me again that the game mechanics in the story don't really matter. Like, um, it could be the case that the story was written in advance and then later on these like notifications and skill things were added in later, which is why they don't quite match up perfectly. Or that this isn't really a well fleshed out system. Um, and that kind of, it feels like it's more like that secondary case. Um, the big reason the main character plays this game, now this is where the plot thing comes in. Um, the big reason the main character plays the game is that he has a goal to reach, uh, to, to take a ship in real life off of Mars and to start over on Earth. He needs $100,000. That's that's the big reason he's doing all this stuff, why he's playing the game in the first place. He wants to get, get enough game credits um, to transfer them into real life uh, at a 10 to 1 ratio and, and accomplish these goals. So he needs $100,000, which, uh, you know, um, so, and it's ruled at, at, at about the 17% mark that he already has $83,000 um, in real life saved up. So he also wants an extra $50,000 $50, for seed money to start over. So those are his goals. He wants a total of $150,000 real life money to, to accomplish his goal. And so this is where math comes in. Uh, at that 70% mark, it's also revealed again. So he has 83,000. Uh, so he basically needs um, 50, 60, uh, $67,000. Uh, essentially to accomplish his goal. Um, but when you actually review the beginning of this novel, uh, in the game, he already had $500,000, which at a 10 to one conversion ratio comes down to $50,000. So he actually already had essentially all the money he needed at the very beginning of the story to accomplish his goal. And it's also revealed the part that before he started this whole long quest line, he'd, he'd had an additional $500,000 in, in game currency um, before he spent it all on respawns in the game. Um, and so all along, He'd had enough money to accomplish his goal from the very start of the story, and he had no reason to play this anymore. So the the fundamental problem of the story has no purpose, uh, according to math, anyways. But again, beyond that, um, you know, so there you go. Um, overall, again, this isn't a bad cyberpunk story. Essentially, the main character goes on a bunch of adventures. He plays this game to like try to earn money and has to restart, and it's 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 proposed in the story that he. He gets his new character that restarts, and so he has to start over learning new skills, um, going on quests to carry the money, goes on adventures with a bunch of groups. And he kind of had his side point at, at some point whether he, whether the goal of earning money is more important or helping the friends he makes in the story. Um, and that's what this is. The action in the story is really good. It is. Um, the werewolf and the VR portions of it, that I, I sometimes had issues with because the real world is so cyberpunk um, that it, does it actually matches the level of fantasy and cyberpunk that's in the game as well. And so sometimes in the story, it's very difficult to tell whether this is supposed to be the VR world or the real world, because there are sci-fi cyberpunk elements in both. And sometimes I think not even the novel describes it well, uh, and it kind of gets confused. Um, so this may be a cyberpunk story that was sort of modified to be literary PG. At least that it, would, it feels like occasionally in the story, whether it is or not, I don't know uh, for sure. Um, but there's just like these word moments where like, you're all, is this the game still, or this is, is this real life? And that was sometimes confusing sometimes. Um, as little RPG, the game mechanics in the story are bad. I mean, they don't, if they, if they don't mean anything in the story, they don't matter. Like why, why even bother if you're not going to follow the rules of your own, of your own game system that you're in, that you have in the story. Um, and that's kind of the thing that ruined it for me in particular. Um, the, the rest of it is fine. It really is like the cyberpunk part. If it was just a cyberpunk story, I'd be like, Oh yeah, this is fine. This is cool. Go, go give it a read. Um, but because I'm judging it as a WG where like the gaming kind of are supposed to matter and they're supposed to be having an impactful part of the story. Um, that doesn't really exist here, at least as far as like the math that I could do on the story. Uh, so for me, it gets a score of six out of 10. Again, I don't think it's horribly written or anything. It just didn't work for me because I saw that the game mechanics really, even though they're, they're shown throughout the story and they, there were plenty of skill increases throughout the entire novel, it's just that fundamentally like, Oh, they don't matter. So I stopped being interested, um, in that aspect of it. So there you go. Um, that's against the score six out of 10 rank zero, a sci-fi literary cyberpunk cyberlinks book. Number one. There you go. Okay. On to review number seven. It's going to be the realm between the curse, a literary saga book. Number one written by Phoenix gray. Okay. It is uh, 259 pages, 99 cents right now. I believe that's a special limited time introductory price tag. Um, it's also available on Kindle limited though. Here is the author's description. An epic lit RPG saga for fans of Lord of the Rings, Grimgar, and Dungeons and Dragons. Honestly, none of that's true. 
Um, but anyways, um, Will refused to admit the HR lady at Radical in- Interaction that he never played their WWE virtual reality MMORPG The Realm. From what he'd seen in videos and heard from reviews, the game sucked. But with the company's failed attempt at entertaining game industry, they switched their sites to focus on smaller educational programs. Being a better tester for Radical Interactive was not the dream job that Will had envisioned, but he'd hoped that it would get his foot in the door one day becoming a graphic designer for the company. As he filled out his new hire paperwork, he never realized that he was literally signing away his life. Now, a phenomenally successful company, Radical Interactive has secretly working on something behind behind closed doors that would change both medical gaming and industries forever. The realm was reborn. The only problem was that it wasn't a game, at least not to those trapped inside. Dumped into a magical fantasy world with nightmarish monsters, all inspiring magic, and way more walking than Will thought he was physically capable of as a nerdy dash hockey, he has to navigate the perils of the realm and unravel the mysteries of how he came to be here and how to get out. Fantasy meets real life consequences in a game... They could be in the difference between life and death. But first, Will must get over being a noob. So there we go. There's a lot of promise there. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, the blurb overhypes this story a ton. It's not epic. Um, it's not filled with nightmarish monsters. There's not a ton of, of magic in the system, in this game thing at all, to be honest. Um, it's slice of life, and the main character fights pixies and goblins. That's it. It's it's really, like I said, it's super overhyped there. Um, the beginning... 10% of the story is a gigantic woe is me section. The main character laments uh, about how he has this, you know, game design degree and he never gets to use it despite applying to all the game companies. Like nobody's hiring. And when he finally gets in the door at this one place that the, instead of being a game designer, he's working on these like educational simulations and he hates it, even though he, he had just complained about like not having a job for like the last, you know, couple chapters. He complains about that, he complains about his ex-girlfriend, he complains about his, you know, his life, and even, like I said, it's, it's a bunch of, like, excuses to get the main character stuck in a game. Um, he has this accident, and so he, the, the game company puts him into this, um, it, it's supposed to be a version of their old MMORPG that's supposed to, like, help stimulate brain activity by keeping it active, and again, it's all just, like, this huge excuse of, like, oh, he's trapped in the game. Okay, there it is. So that, that's all it really comes down to. Um, but it was just kind of this annoying, whiny section of the novel um and it just turns into i mean once he ends the game world though it's actually not a bad uh, a bad story necessarily um the main character has to figure out the game rules he doesn't and again this is another thing kind of bothering me he, he has amnesia in the game world for some reason um only it's like super selective like he doesn't remember any of his personal past but he knows that he's in a video game and he knows what mmos are and he knows the vr is and he's much of these other like remembrances um but he just doesn't remember who he is like really or like how he got there and again slightly slight, you know, anything um but the main character does a bunch of slice of life adventure stuff he figures out the rules goes on some training and he kills things and he goes into adventures um that see there are goals that main character has but it's mostly him following other people around while they deal with like the dark happenings on their island um there are some semi-regular action um, but there's a lot more talking and describing his stuff than anything else um after the 75 percent mark of the story it lost me to be honest like up until like the point like so between the 10 percent mark and the 75 percent mark the story is actually doing decently well like it really is like the main character is going on a bunch of adventures he's uh learning like the specifics of these game mechanics in the world and like oh he's also like connecting with some of the um i guess we'll call them npcs but they're just like regular people in this fantasy rpg world um learning their backgrounds connecting with some not connecting with others like learning you know world history like the the, the history of this particular like island and world and what their problems are going like this minor quest that they kind of like going to this um this quest line um then at the 75 percent mark it just takes a huge turn into boring and it was really super unfortunate because up to that point like everything's going along pretty well like there's some semi-regular action that at the center percent mark it just stops being interesting like, the action stops um and there's a lot of talking there's like a ton of planning on doing stuff but like very little actually happens after that point it kind of serves as like this this whole like 25 percent section where it's setting things up for the next book instead of like resolving them here in any way shape or form um and it was just like this big like boring ish section like like things happen there and there were definitely some like advancements of the plot to a degree but it's never it's like super boring it's like uh, so and, and it's just that, that's where it lost me that's that's where it lost stopped being entertaining for me um so it is unfortunate um on the rpg mechanic side there are rpg mechanics here there's nothing really new or um innovative here you see a stat sheet you see skills you see item descriptions all that good stuff is here um 
as the main character levels, he gets um, stat points to increase, and he gets a skill point to increase any one of his skills. But it's all very common stuff. It's all stuff you've probably read a million times. Um, however, some of the combat scenes were a little bit wand wavy, and that the main character probably shouldn't have done as well a few a few of these times. It's not like a major thing that's throughout the entire show, but it, there were a few places where it's like, oh, that was a little too easy for a guy who was just having a trouble like beating pixies a few like sentences ago and all of a sudden you're killing things higher level than you but with one arrow i'm like mm, doesn't make sense but again that, that's a small small thing on the game mechanic side um where the story does really do something good is that the character development is actually really well done um the characters in the story are well fleshed out they have their own personalities they have interesting points of view and they're not defined as simply being all good and all bad like every single one of these characters in the story um feels feels very real like feel like they make bad decisions and they're suffering the consequences of them throughout the story or that they've they've tried to be as good as possible and they're defending like their relatives against like um people who are like uh, antagonizing their making issues even though they might themselves think that, that their families are great people or they might argue with them uh and so like the, the real like social connection between these characters is like really probably the highlight of the story but it doesn't it kind of isn't enough. Like that's like the part that is most special. Everything else is kind of like, Oh, I've read, I've read that before. I've read chapter in game. I've read all these gaming mechanics. The game mechanics story are, are very much like, Oh, I've read these a dozen, uh, dozens of times basically. Um, and so beyond that, the well-developed thought of characters, nothing is really special here. Like this, the slice of life stuff is, it's not bad. It's just like, Oh, I've these, this is just a quest line. Uh, and it's just like, Oh, the action is, only okay like the, it's just not like particularly special either um and again after that cinema percent mark the story really just it lost me it was like oh i was like having a decent time up to him it's like oh this is this shit got boring it got boring i'm like okay there you go and that that's why it's not getting a better score for me basically it gets a score six out of ten for me personally um that's the realm between the the curse a little pretty saga book number one i'm probably gonna pick a book two if it comes out and i'm just hoping that it become that it does better um, I'm hoping it, it, it becomes like super special and amazing because I think the story, the series might have the potential, even though this one didn't kind of do anything. Um, I think the character development is worth it, at least for me to, to try a second, but if that one sucks or if that doesn't do what well, I should say, I'll probably drop the series. But for me, this one didn't really work out. Um, by the end of the story, it, it lost me. So that it is what it is. Um, it gets scored again a six out of 10 for the realm between the curse. Okay, last but not least is Viridian Gate Online Side Quest, a lit RPG anthology. Um, there's a lot of authors here, including James A. Hunter, DJ Bowden, um, N.H. Paxton, Raymond Johnson, uh, J.D. Astra, and Nicholas Reed. Okay, it is uh, 257 pages. It is $4.99. It is available on Can Limited. Here's the author's description. The end is coming. An extinction-level asteroid is cannonballing towards Earth, and humanity's half hours. A lucky few earn a one-way ticket to the brand new ultra-immersive fantasy-based VR MMO RPG Viridian Gate Online. Making that leap of faith might mean survival, but it comes at a steep price tag. Travelers will be forever be stranded as digital avatars inside of a fantastic world filled with vicious monsters, powerful AIs, and cutthroat players. Let the games begin. So like six amazing authors, six incredible new tales, all sent in this best-selling Viridian Gate online universe. Side quests as an anthology for fans by the fans. And that's totally true. All these people who wrote here, um, the author, James A. Hunter, and his um, publishing company, um, they had a contest where they were like taking submissions from from whoever who were writing like essentially these these uh, independent um, side stories for the set in the same universe. And these are the folks that did the best and they were collected in the story. And so these are literally, you know, fans of the stories reading, writing, um, stories for this universe. So good stuff there. Uh, now as with any kind of anthology or like short story collection, um, each story is written by a different person and some are going to appeal to you as a reader and some aren't. It's just kind of the way it is. And, and a lot of that's going to be individualized. Uh, so for me personally, I'm actually judging each one of these individually and then I'll kind of give a review of the anthology, whether it's worth it, um, on the whole at the very end. Uh, so the first story in this collection is called a gentleman's work by James A. Hunter. Uh, here's the description for that particular short story. It is 
when an impersonal inquisitor captures a thieves guild operative, Cutter must undertake a deadly rescue mission while using every uh, grift in the book to stay one step ahead of the headman's blade. And the prize for the, uh, this extraordinary quest? Nothing short of the keys of Rothenwell's thieves guild. Deception, subterfuge, and heavy drinking, all in a day's work for a gentleman. So it's a really nice description. Um, and it's absolutely true. Um, this is the longest of the short stories. Like this one takes up a full third of the novel, the full third of the page, I should say. Uh, and it's written by the author of the, of the main series, reading it online. And it's probably the story that most fans are going to come for. Um, it focuses on Cutter, who's the NPC companion for the main character in BGO. And if you like that character or you just kind of want something that's like a good breaking story, um, you're going to like this. I agree you will really well. You know, and for me personally, it was nice to get some background Cutter. Um, but He's not my favorite character. Like, he's an okay character. For me, he does a good job of, like, uh, comedic relief. He's very loyal to the main character, and I appreciate his skills in that respect. But um, I just wasn't interested enough for him to, full, like, read, like, a full-on, like, short story about him and what he does in the Thieves Guild thing. I, I'm just not, I'm personally, I, I don't like playing a rogue when I play MMOs either. Uh, so it wasn't really my kind of thing. It didn't really, like, appeal. Like, the, the writing is good. The good, um, there's good action heist stuff happening here. I don't just feel like the plot. Um, I just couldn't get into it. And that, that's me personally. I absolutely admit that. I think, again, a lot of people who enjoy the series, who enjoy the cutter character, uh, are going to like this a lot more than I am. But for me, um, it just didn't really hit for, for me. So I guess the score was 6.9 out of 10. Again, that's, I'm saying 6.9 because I'm like, oh, this, there's a lot of good here, stuff here. It's just like, oh, it didn't quite land for me personally. So it's just shy of being good. And that's all that means. Okay. Uh, the second story in the short story series is The Funeral Parlor by Raymond Johnson. Um, here's the description for that short story. A young spiderling is stranded in an alien land, surrounded by hostile creatures. Forced to fight for her life in a bid to find her way home, she must transform into the predator she is destined to become or die alone and forgotten, trapped in a dark world known as the Shadowverse. So there you go. Um, honestly, this is just, this is a nice, simple story. It's, it's simple. It's short. It comes in at about 8% of the total word count. Um, the story is told from the point of view of the monster, the spider lane. Um, and while I would have actually personally loved to have seen more RPG evolutions, it's a good story with action and very accurate arachnid anatomy. So good for you. Um, score is 7.3 out of 10, full disclosure. Uh, Raymond Johnson is the host of the Lit RPG audiobook podcast, which I produce, um, and is sponsored by Magic, um, sponsored by, uh, Jeff Hayes' uh, narration company, which escapes my brain for the moment. So, sorry, Jeff. Uh, but, so he's, he's part of, like, the, the communion here in, in, in for, for the Little Beauty Podcast. Um, but he's, he, he did right. He wrote a cute story. So, good for you, man. Super proud of you, buddy. Um, and you should get this based on just on that one good story. But there's a lot of good stories here. Okay. Um, here is the next one. It is the rating of Roth and Wath. <laughs> I can never say that right. Roth and Heath. Uh, by J.D. Astra. Oh, I'm sorry. It, uh, that's got a score of 7.3 to 10. So for the, the one, the funeral parlor, I don't remember if I said it or not, a score of 7.3 to 10. Okay, next short story. The Raiding of Roth and Roth. Uh, by J.D. Astra. Uh, the short story description is, The Crimson Alliance has breached the walls of, Ro of Roth and Hearth, exciting Alexio Carrera's rage. Now Abbey and a ragtag invasion crew must reach the Keep's command center before the defending troops mobilize and shut down the takeover. Else, they'll lose the battle and the war for Elgard's freedom. Um, this is takes up 11% uh, percent of the total war count, but it felt longer to me. Um, this is one of those stories that tells you the events of something you've already read about, only from someone else's point of view. Um, the writing isn't bad. I just got bored with it since it takes place in an event that I've read about before. It gets a score of 5 out of 10 for me. I thought it was boring. But again, this is again one of those personal preferences. I, I, I actively dislike generally when I'm reading about something I've already read about. Unless it's from like some other character and it actually matters in the long run to like the events of that story. But if you're just telling me something from like someone else's point of view and I've already read about the story, it's like, I've already read this. Why am I reading this again? And that's what goes to my head every time I read one of these kind of short stories. Um, so it just didn't fundamentally work for me. Um, there are, I mean, so the bat, the fights in here are fine. Um, you're going to see some characters you're familiar with through the story. Um, but it's not told from anyone's point of view. Who's, who's who bridge on that's I think one of the stipulations of like the short story uh, contest is that it has to be told from somebody who's not like one of the main characters who you're, you're never going to see with the exception of the one where I'm the author um, 
one of these short stories like told from the main character's point of view or into like the secondary you know characters generally they might make special appearances uh but that's as much as you're going to get uh but for me this one just didn't work so sorry uh next short story the ballad of jaro edgewalker by nh paxton author description jaro is an assassin and he's good at it when he finds a foe that is insurmountable by no means and uncovers a plot to destroy everything he loves, Jaro has to balance his morality with his love for his friends and make an incredibly difficult decision. And that's actually a really good description. Um, this is probably my second favorite short story in the anthology. It comes in at 14% of the total page count, uh, and it's definitely one of the best planned out of the short stories. Like it has a great original characters. Um, it's really solid storytelling, and it's told with an ending that has a very solid end uh it's nothing ambiguous it's very like i'm like oh that's when i read the end i'm like there you go that's that's a good end uh and it still ties very well into the video universe so for me i uh, get to score 7.6 out of 10 uh and that's the ballad of jero edge rocker with score 7.6 out of 10 so i enjoyed it okay next is buried alive by nicholas reed here's the author's description carlos vega thinks he's escaping certain death by entering the virtual world of EGO, but instead he's swallowed alive by the deadly barren sands, who have to overcome the riddles and the horrors of a long-forgotten temple in order to escape. But can he do it before the evil sealed there centuries ago finds him? Um, this is an okay short story. It, it's fine. Um, it feels rather distant from the VGO universe. Um, it kind of feels like VGO, Ancient Egyptian Edition, um, and it's a total of 50% of the page count. It didn't really work for me. Like I liked some of the magic systems that are that are shown here. It's just that again, it didn't feel like it was a part of like the general VGO um, mythos and story. Like it, it does its own kind of Egyptian themed edition kind of story. Like there's still like gimmick, gimmick mechanics. I think she's like, oh, this one didn't really hit for me. So it gets a score of six out of ten. Um, and last but not least, a final kindness by D. J. Bowden. Here's the author's description. Alan Campbell was a taker, uh, was a talker, not a fighter, until someone murdered his girl. He'd almost given up on finding the killers. Now he's got a fresh lead, a trio of mercenaries who outclass him in every way but his wits. He'll cheat, he'll bluff, and steal to get his revenge, and as one of VGO's immortal travelers, he's willing to die trying. There you go, pretty good actually. Um, this is without a doubt my favorite short story in the anthology. Um, it's the second longest at 19% of the total paint count, but it goes by so quickly because of the great pacing, the mysteriously unraveling plot, and the really well done character development. I think that's probably one of the best things about this. The story is kind of the most removed from the VGO universe, um, and it has the least amount of game mechanics but of any of the short stories, but it also is the most heart, and, it ha and the cutaways that the story does give amazingly good backstory um, for the characters that are in the story, like even like the side characters and secondary and tertiary characters, like they're the, as the story unfolds, it almost funds out, um, unfolds as a whodunit of like, oh, who murdered his girl? And the story unfolds like telling about who she was, how they interacted, but it does so like with these like small little cutaways. As like he's he's following these people um, for like training for the uh, for the army, um, and it's like I said, really well done, great stuff. Uh, like I said, it, it's the best short story in this anthology, at least to me. It gets a score of 7.8 out of 10. I had a really good time with it. Um, so there you go. That's the final kindness with a score of 7.8 out of 10. Um, overall, I think this anthology does a really good job of what it's meant to do, which is highlight all the different kind of stories that can be created within the same universe. Um, and while I didn't love every single story, I had a good time reading most. And for me, that's kind of what matters. Like, even though like there are always going to be these little story issues um, and things you think can be done better or differently or whatever the case is, um, I had a good time with it, so I, I rec totally recommend it. You get to score seven out of ten. That's for reading. Get online a side quest. Uh, sorry, side quests. Uh, a little RPG anthology with a score seven out of ten. I had a good time. Go check it out. And that's it. We're done. Everyone, woohoo! All finished. Um, thank you very much for listening, for watching. You can remember, you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, Patreon, uh, YouTube, um, our website, all kinds of fun places. Um, if you enjoy the podcast in any way, shape, or form, and want to support us, remember because this show does not exist without your support, folks. This is this is completely funded by the audience. Um, so your support in, in helping to keep this thing ad free and free to put out there for the universe is absolutely super important. Uh, if you want to help support us, you can find out all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. Um, again, thank you very much for hanging out with me today, ladies and gentlemen. Until we can hang out again, remember to go read some little RPG. Goodbye, everybody.